Welcome, 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 friend. I'm TK, your tour guide to the past, and you are listening to For the Love of History, the podcast where we talk about world history, women's history, and weird history. And today we are so, so fortunate to have a writer with us, an author of two novels, a poet, a writing teacher of 20 years, the absolutely fabulous Carmelo Martino. I am so excited to have you here. Carmela. thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you. I'm very pleased to be here talking to you today. Yes. So I got an email a few weeks ago from Carmela letting me know that she listened to the episode with June Her about her book, The Red Palace, after reading it in a, why can I not think of that word? Book club. <laughs> Reading circle? No, that's not what that's in a book club. And she is an author herself and have has just written the book Playing by Heart, which is also set in the 18th century. And I'm very excited. I, I don't I won't go too far into explanation of the book. So Carmela, well, let's just get get started right away with talking about playing by heart. Could you let us know what the book is about? Okay. As you said, it's set in the 18th century mm -hmm. and it's inspired by two real sisters who lived at that time. So that's why I was so thrilled to talk to you about women's history because that plays an important part in the story. And the two sisters are very unusual. They're very well educated, which is uncommon for women of the time. Mm -hmm. But the main character, Amelia, wants to compose. She's a wonderful musician, has a love of music, but as the second sister in those days, an upper-class Italian girl had only two options. Uh, she was either in an arranged marriage or she went to the convent. And because she wants to pursue music, she hopes not to end up in the convent and sets about trying to make herself so important in her father's goals to become a nobleman that he won't consider sending her to the convent. So that's, that's the basic premise and then of course a lot else happens yes yes there's a, a slight aspect of of romance in the book as well but her father there the girl her older sister is as i said educated as well she's a, a linguist and studies math and science and entertains guests in their home these meetings like soiree you call them soirees in french they were called conversazioni in italian mm -hmm. And the father would try to impress the nobility and the upper class so that he could hopefully become a nobleman himself. That was his ultimate goal. So he was basically using his daughters to advance himself in society. Yeah, as like social clout in a way. Yes, yes. So can you drop us into history a little bit? My my cat joins our, <laughs> our recording session. I'm so sorry. So, Welcome to Ted. Thank you for joining us in the podcast. She's a very precocious little kitty. She wants to learn about women's history, also. Yes, yes, she is a fierce feminist. So, so you said that um, this book is set in the 18th century, the 1700s. So, can you tell us a little bit about what was going on? in Milan at this time? Yes, so Italy, uh, for people who may not know, actually was a was a was not a united country until around 1860. Before that, it was a lot of, I don't know if you call them city-states, they were separate. Mm -hmm. Venice was its own republic, but other parts were, were part of other dynasties, basically. And Milan was part of the duchy the Habsburg, it was called the Duchy of Milan. It was part of the Habsburg Empire and it was ruled by the Austrian Habsburgs. Oh, okay. So they, in fact, um, and one of the things, I learned so much history, I didn't even know. I'm Italian American. My parents mm -hmm. were in Italy, Central Italy, but I did not know all this about Italian history until I started researching the book. And yeah. the opening of the novel is set when a new uh, interim governor is comes from the, the Habsburg ruler sends a new governor, Governor Von Tron, comes mm -hmm. to Milan and the girl's father wants to impress him at, at the welcoming uh, gala. It's going to mm -hmm. be during the Christmas season. And so the older sister is going to give a talk, a presentation of a poem. Mm -hmm. And then the younger sister's my main character is going to perform. Yeah, that's so interesting. I also had no idea 
that the Habsburgs had anything to do with Italy and that Italy was so separated at this time. It's so interesting. When I think of Italian history, I, I'm always brought back to Catholic history and the Catholic Church and and all of the popes and their, their shenanigans. So it's really interesting to see a different side of Italian history from women's perspective. So can you tell us a little bit about your main character? Who is so, a real person? <laughs> well, she Amelia is inspired by a woman named Maria Teresa Agnesi, mm -hmm. who was one of the first Italian women to compose a serious opera. Wow. And uh, she was known as a wonderful harpsichordist and singer and composer. And several of her compositions were composed in the Royal Ducal Theater. She also dedicated several compositions to the uh, Empress. So Habsburgs were ruled by Empress Maria Theresa. In the opening of the novel, she's not Empress yet, her father is Emperor, but uh, she comes in, near the end of the novel, the Empress, future Empress, who's an Archduchess, comes to visit Milan. So they actually meet her. But so they are now I lost my train of thoughts. That's an opera dedicated to <laughs> Maria Theresa. She also wrote a collection of arias and Maria Theresa, the the Duchess loved music, and mm -hmm. it's that, that she used to go around singing the arias that that the character Maria Teresa Agnesi is very confusing because their names are so similar. Yeah, uh, <laughs> my composer composed arias that the Archduchess, who when she became Empress, would actually like to sing around the house because she liked to sing. So oh, she was she was a huge music fan. Uh, so Maria. Teresa, who inspired my novel, that's why I changed mm -hmm. her name to Amelia because it was yeah. all <laughs> Thank you. So she was a composer in real life, and uh, some of her music was performed, which also is rather unusual for women composers at that time. We don't know if they ever composed, if they ever actually performed one of her operas, though, that we don't have any evidence one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, her older sister, who was named also, her name was Maria Gaetana, studied wow. languages, and you know, it made sense. I know when we, I've only been to Milan once in, in my life, and that was before I decided to write this book, so that didn't help me a lot. But <laughs> I, one of the things that impressed me is if you walk, there's a lot of little shops, and as you, uh, the shop clerks stand in the doorways and they peg you your nationality as you walk by, and they greet you in whatever language they think you will understand. Wow. At least that's what they did when we were there. And so they most of them are fluent in at least three or four or five languages wow. because because they're in northern italy and they're on the border with switzerland and so they get a lot of german so they usually speak german italian french and english and wow so it you know so it's not uncommon so the the elder sister who inspired the story spoke seven languages by the time she was a teen and she had a gift for math and ended up being she wrote the first book that covered everything from basic math through algebra geometry trigonometry to the new calculus because calculus was relatively new at that time so she became known for that and the pope at the time was very he was very knowledgeable himself and he was very pro science and had studied math and she sent him a copy of the math book that she wrote. He was so impressed with it, he appointed her to be a woman professor at the University of Bologna. And she would have been the first female professor ever of mathematics, but she turned it down. <gasps> wow. Well, listen, so I know you're going to ask me later, but I'm going to go ahead and tell you now. Please. The, reason, the reason I wrote this book is I first encountered the elder sister, the one mm -hmm. who was a mathematician. And I have an undergraduate degree in math and computer science. So I um, have a love of math and I had never heard of this woman. Uh -huh. I was really upset. I thought I should, yeah. know that I should have heard of her because she could have been somebody that was a role model for me. And yeah. so, and then the more I read about her, the more I wanted to know. And so I originally wanted to write a biography for young people about Maria Gaetana and Yacy, the mathematician. Mm. And one of the things that impressed me about her, not only that she was amazing with math and languages and sciences at a time when women typically didn't even study such things mm -hmm. but she and she was a celeb both both these young women were celebrities of their day 
because of their notoriety, because they did such unusual things, and because their father entertained people in his home with their gifts. So she was very famous, especially after publishing the book. But as soon as their father died, she gave it all up. She didn't want fame. She really had a heart to help the poor. So she gave up all of that and devoted the rest of her life to helping the poor. And at the time in Milan, they had a number of people in the streets. They had beggars, you know, street people, homeless people, sick people. And she eventually, the, the uh, archbishop created a, a new facility for the, the homeless that was a hospital and a shelter. And she became the first director of the women's section of that facility. And she spent the rest of her life helping the poor. And so I was so impressed with her, I wanted to tell that story. I've written that story, but I haven't found a publisher yet for that story. But Publishers we, out there, <laughs> calling to you. <laughs> yes, it's a nonfiction biography for one leaders of an amazing history. <laughs> I think of her as the Mother Teresa of Milan, because mm -hmm. that, was, that was her. She would, one of her sisters, in one of the biographies I read, her younger, one of her other sisters, not the, not the composer, was couldn't believe that she would physically nurse the sick women in their own home before mm -hmm. her father died and she had started working out outside mm -hmm. the home. She would bring these women in and she herself would care for them. And she, you know, here's this wealthy woman who had servants and all that, but she would yeah. herself care for these women in her home. Oh so, my gosh. so her story just really stuck with me. And the mm -hmm. other thing, she has a role in women's history. Well, both, both of the girls do, but I wanted to share her story with you because of, she has a role in women's history that I had no idea about until I started researching her. Yeah. And Maria Gaetana Agnesi was nine years old. She, uh, it's debatable whether she wrote it or she translated a essay from Italian into Latin about mm -hmm. why women should be educated. It was in a way, we don't have clear evidence, but it's, seems like it was tied to, in 1723 in, in Venice, there was a big debate at an academic society about whether or not women should be educated. And of course, the two people, are, you know, the two sides of the debate were both argued by men. They didn't let women yeah, right. <laughs> argue, you know. The that was about. They let women no. in the audience, but they weren't allowed to argue for themselves. Cool. So anyway, these two men argued the pros and cons of allowing allowing women to study and came up with the verdict that only a select few women who really had a passion should be allowed to study the liberal arts. And this didn't sit well with the aristocratic women of that time. Yeah. And so many of them were upset. So then like about five years later, they, they put together a booklet of the, the debate and the, and the conclusion of the debate. But then they also included a rebuttal from a woman who was a poet. I'd have to look up. She was a poet and a writer, and I have to look up her name. I don't remember at this point. But they also included in the booklet a copy of the essay that Maria Gaetana Agnesi translated it at age nine because it, it talked about. And so Maria, as a nine-year-old, presented this essay or speech from memory. It was over an hour long to guess at her father's home. And that, that was what started her career at these conversazioni, entertaining. She started, it went over so well. You know, this is all part of the enlightenment and her father mm -hmm. invited all the, all the enlightened men of the time to his meeting. And so this started him having these conversaciones in his home and eventually the younger sister joined in and she would play the harpsichord and sing. And so they would have these soirees to impress the nobility. So I thought it was very fascinating, especially at not only, you know, was this debate about, of course, we're only talking about upper class women. They weren't yeah. having educating poor. There wasn't really much of a middle class to speak of, but, mm -hmm. but the working class, they weren't mm -hmm. talking about that. Most of those people had, could read, could not read at all, men or women. So it was just, it's a very interesting time in women's history, I thought. And the fact that there were, the, you know, there were some men like their father who had their daughters educated was very interesting. It's very interesting that he had his daughters educated, but kind of for his own benefit. Yes. 
So I want to be like, yay, their dad, he's great. But also I'm like, oh, is he though? Because he only educated them in order to further his position, which, you know, there's something to be said for that. So I am glad that they got an education and then they were able to use their talents. But also I'm like, oh, don't think that we forgot. Don't think that we forgot the reason why you did this. So, so I think it's a fascinating story and I had to fictionalize it because I couldn't get enough of, the, you know, the, enough primary source information to be able to tell it as an engaging nonfiction. Yeah. I did try to incorporate as, as many true things as I could find. So mm -hmm. the governor that I mentioned in the beginning, he was indeed the governor of that time mm -hmm. and the, the musicians and the other people that I mentioned and the Archduchess's visit, they're actually, I, I was so, <laughs> the history geek in me comes out. I was so excited when I found on the internet a primary source document describing the visit of the Archduchess to Milan, a first person account. And the only, only downside was it was written in Italian and it was written in 18th century Italian. <laughs> I can barely read modern Italian. You know, like if you try to read the Scarlet Letter now, I mean, yeah. you know how hard it is to read English that was written mm -hmm. a long time ago. Well, it's just as hard to read Italian that's written a long time. It took me forever, but I managed to translate it. And, nice. I, and I used, you know, like the fact that it was pouring rain when she visited and they had planned to have a welcoming ceremony for her outside, but because mm -hmm. of the they had to take it indoors and they gave her the keys to the city and all that. So I put all that into the story. So as much as I could, I tried to incorporate true events from history mm -hmm. into the story. So I, I didn't tell you too that I was a freelance writer before. Oh. I, I was a stringer for newspapers and magazines too. So that's, I think, part of where I get my nose for news sort of thing that I want. I want facts. I want something yeah. to substantiate what I'm saying. And I think too that incorporating those things makes the history come alive and makes it more relatable for the reader. And when I read historical fiction, I like to learn about history at the same time. And yeah. so that's why I, another reason I try to incorporate some of that in there too. Yeah, it's very interesting that you, so there was a lack of primary resources, a lack of information. So you decided to turn it into a historical fiction. So there's a lot of, not a lot of, there, there are people out there that do kind of turn up their nose at historical fiction. And I am not one of those people. I love historical fiction. So I want to know what your take is on the importance of historical fiction books in history education and learning about history. Well, I know for, for some young people, there's no way they're going to read a straight historical. Though I have to say, a lot of the straight historical being published today is much more engaging than what was around when I was in school. Yeah. <laughs> but even the modern nonfiction is wonderful about history. I think those authors focus on the story and that's what readers need, especially mm -hmm. readers that are not necessarily history nuts. You know, they, mm -hmm. they, need, they need a story to pull them into the history. Yeah. So, so that's why I think, I think historic, that's what historical fiction does, especially mm -hmm. for for places and times where we may not have enough data to, to write a straight nonfiction, we can still tell a story that's imbued in the world of that time with the details of that time as much as possible. Now, I know not every historical novelist is probably as nitpicky as I am, but I I went back and I found like, you know, the Duke Hall Theater where they, where they went to the opera. There's a scene where they go to the opera and that theater no longer exists because it burned down, so I couldn't find images of it. But yeah. I did find in in some historical documents, I found diagrams of what the interior looked like, so mm -hmm. that I was able to visualize it and describe that to my reader. And I found, you know, well, from my own visit to Milan and, and from my research, I found the kind of art that would hang inside the kinds of homes that are in my story. And so I, I found real works of art that I used as models in my mind. I don't name them in the book, but mm -hmm. they, they are definitely plausible details in the story to make it real. And the other thing I did was I found a wonderful expert in the music of 16th and 17th century 
Italy. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and there are, there, are, there are experts who specialize in that. And it turned out he's in Chicago. I'm outside Chicago and he's in the University of Chicago. Nice. And, and he was so generous. I mean, you can find professors' emails online and I had emailed him and he was very generous with his time. I did a phone interview with him to make sure the things that I ha had in the novel were plausible. I did not mm -hmm. want to have anything in there because in, in real life, we don't know, for example, the real composer that I modeled my character after, we don't know when she learned music, who her teacher was or anything like that. We can speculate based on their social class and, and mm -hmm. who, who the good teachers were at the time, but we don't know for sure. So I never say who her teacher specifically was. One of the questions I asked this music professor is, is I, I really wanted to have a scene where my character, my composer met the Archduchess. And so I asked him, I said, do you think it's plausible that they would have met. And he thrilled me to pieces when he said, I don't think it's just plausible. I think they pretty much, they must have met, you know, <laughs> given the status and what was going on. He said, I can almost guarantee you that they met. So that was, that was really wonderful for me to hear. And so, uh, so again, I tried to, you know, I tried to make sure I didn't have anything that wasn't plausible, but sometimes it was so hard. Like I wanted to know what they would be eating, you know, if I wow. mentioned food, because food, especially in Italian culture, is very important. So important, yeah. And, you know, that wasn't always easy to figure out what they would have eaten. And, you know, so sometimes I kind of had to extrapolate, but I was researching books on the history of food and the history of Italian home life and, you know, all these things. And again, because of the fact that Italy was really these separate sort of city states, made it that much harder. Yeah. To research, because, the way of life in Southern Italy, which was part of, I think, Spain at the time, could have been mm -hmm. quite different from Milan, which was part of the Habsburg dynasty. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, one of my favorite parts about your book is the world building that you do. So it's really nice to know that so much care and research was put into creating this world because I really do feel like I stepped into, you know, 1700s Milan. And the book for me is really an easy read in that it was easy to imagine what was going on, even though I have basically zero knowledge of <laughs> Milan during this time period. I wasn't lost in in the history of it i i was able to immerse myself in it so we've talked a lot about the research that's gone in the history behind it so what is the book about so we have these two sisters who are extraordinary you know prodigies to use you know some of your words from the book what are these two girls facing? What are they doing in the book without giving away too much information so people go read it? Yeah, it's, well, the characters are both adolescents at the time. Mm -hmm. My main character is, is 15 at the beginning and her sister is about two years older. Mm -hmm. So they are trying to find themselves just like any teenager, even today, trying to figure out who they are, what is their calling in life? And, mm -hmm. and they, can they follow that calling and how can they be true to themselves? And that's what they are both struggling with. And the older sister in the book, the father, as I said, you know, was using her to impress people and her calling is she wants to be a nun. I modeled her after the real life mathematician mm -hmm. who in real life at age 18 asked her father for permission to become a nun. She wanted wow. to be a nun to work with an order that helped the homeless. Specifically, wow. specifically with that order, her father said no. And so in the novel, she does, my character also wants to be a nun, but her father wants to marry her off to, mm. to again, raise his standing. And she doesn't mm. want to marry. And the second daughter does want to marry, ultimately, hopefully find someone who loves music the way she does, allow her to continue with her music, which not mm -hmm. every husband would do. Yeah. Um, so, you know, she doesn't, as she matures, she realized that's what she wants in life. I mean, she wants to make music and music is very important. Um, one of the themes also of the novel is the healing property of music, because I also mm -hmm. didn't see near the beginning of the novel, the family suffers a tragedy. Mm -hmm. And that's when my main character really blooms as, as a 
composer and a musician because mm -hmm. she's struggling with that sorrow of loss and the, she finds healing through music. Mm -hmm. And so, so she feels her calling is music. And she, if she is to marry, wants to marry someone who will let her continue in that calling. Yeah, I mean, I think that is an absolutely perfect summary of, of the main points of the book without giving away too much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. So your your book is a YA book, and I am a proponent of anybody can read YA books at any age, anytime, anywhere. But I'm wondering why why did you choose to go the YA route instead of making it for an older audience? Part of that is, you know, because the characters are adolescents, you tend to market it to YA more than to adults. Though I wrote it, as you say, so that adults would enjoy it too. And I've had many adults tell me that they've enjoyed it. I wanted them to be adolescents because that is when they would have been facing these issues. Women married young in those days, arranged marriages were young. There's a, a different character that my main character meets and becomes close friends with Gabriella, who ends up marrying at 16 because it's an arranged marriage. Is it 16 or 17? No, I forgot. But anyway, she's a teenager when she marries. And that's just the way it was um, at the time. Mm -hmm. And so it just felt that the girls had to be that eight in those ages, teenagers. Mm -hmm. And the publishers felt that, that because the girls are teenagers, that it's a YA novel, even though, as you say, adults, anyone yeah. can read this. I mean, it would hopefully touch whoever is going to read it and learn from it too, I hope. Yes, yeah. I as as an adult lady, <laughs> I I thoroughly enjoyed the book and really I think that this is one of those books that you can read multiple times at any age and get something else out of it. You know, there's those books that you you return to over and over again. I know for me that this is going to be one of those books. So, uh to bring us kind of to an end. I'd love to know what your overall message is or your motivation for writing this book. What is the thing that you want people to take away with them after reading this? One of the things I want people to really see what it was like for women of that time period, mm -hmm. how limited their lives were and how controlled they were mm -hmm. by their lives. I mean, as I think I said before, you know, these girls would only have two two possible futures. They were either going to be have an arranged marriage or they were going to be sent to the convent. Mm -hmm. Neither of those choices were up to them. Mm. It was up to the parents and specifically to the father. The father yeah. would decide their future. And I think too few people appreciate that. In my story, these girls are able to pursue the things that they love despite the fact that that's their only option. So that's one thing that I want people to understand that part of our history, even in the Enlightenment, even in a relatively uh, liberal society at the time that they lived in with their father because he was trying to advance himself. The other thing is, I, I also felt, you know, these girls deal with the things typical teenagers today deal with, you know, how do you figure out what you're meant to do in life? Yeah. How, how do you know what to pursue or what not to pursue? How do you learn to be true to yourself? And, you know, speak up for yourself and these girls as limited as they were found ways to to pursue what they wanted despite the world they lived in which you know again because it's it's inspired by real people i find that inspiring and i hope my readers will find that inspiring too that even with limitations you can find your measure of happiness awesome thank you carmela that that is the perfect way. Oh, thank you, Ted. <laughs> Ted agrees. <laughs> the perfect way to end this episode. Thank you so, so much. Again, this book is Playing by Heart by Carmela Martino. Thank you for joining us today, talking about the story, talking about your research process, and bringing this, the story of these two sisters to life in the real world. So um, I'd love to tell my listeners, where they can find you, what else that you have done, anything you'd like to plug at the end of the episode, well, the floor is yours. They can they can find everything they want on my website, pretty much carmelamartino.com, which I assume you'll, you'll have, because yep. the spelling is only has one L in Carmela. Yeah. There's, there's 
there's actually, it wasn't ready in time for the print edition, but I did develop discussion questions. So if people want to use it in a book group or in a classroom or homeschool situation, there's there's even activities to have students do to tie into the story. Um, so that's on my website on the page for Playing by Heart. And then I also created a separate website called mgagnesi.com, which is about the two real life sisters who inspired the story. And unfortunately, there are a lot of myths. And that's, I guess, another reason I wrote the book. There are a lot of myths about the real sisters, mm -hmm. especially the mathematician. And I created the website to dispel some of those myths uh, because one of the most popular ones was that their father was a mathematician. And that's how Maria Gaetana learned how to be a mathematician. Well, it's not true. The father was not a mathematician. His money came from being, his family was in the silk trade. And okay. that's how he made money. He was not a mathematician. And I think it, it makes her accomplishments less if you think her father was a mathematician and that's why she became one. You know, she yeah. did it without him being one. And the other thing that you'll find on mgnacy.com is information about Maria Teresa who inspired the composer character. And there's a link to YouTube video where you can hear her music. Oh my gosh. Some of her music was lost for many years, but they have found some of it. And so um, and you can listen to it. And I have a a link there to a YouTube video where you can listen to some of the music. Um, so I think that's really cool that, you know, people are finding her again as well. And when we talk about my history, I mean, when I was writing this, I don't, I mean, I'm not trained in music. Well, I, I know I played clarinet in high school. But <laughs> that that counts. But um, I had to learn a lot about music and I consulted mm -hmm. experts in that to help me. And I would listen to harpsichord music as mm -hmm. I was writing the manuscript. Oh. And I had to research none of the pieces of music. I, I had to make sure any music I mentioned existed at the time that she was playing. I wouldn't yeah. I couldn't ever perform music that hadn't been written yet. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> and there's a, there's a uh, I even had, I'm a very visual person. So I even found a picture online of a harpsichord that had a mermaid at the base. And that's what inspired my description of harpsichord Amelia plays that has yeah. mermaid at the feet. So, um, so anyway, those are just some asides. But at mgagnesi.com, which I also link to from my website, um, you can find more about the two sisters, the real story of the two sisters and information about both of them. Awesome. Thank yep. you. And right now I'm just publishing poetry. I have a couple books I'm working on, but like we said, we have to find publishers. But I have been publishing poetry, which was always my first love. That's how I started writing was with poetry as a teenager. So I'm um, back to that. So it's, I'm enjoying that. Good. Lovely. Well, we will put all of those links to everything in the show notes so that listeners can enjoy all of the other offerings that Carmela has to offer. <laughs> Once again, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, I will see you in the outro. Thank you again, Carmela. Thank you. Well, dear one, thank you so much for joining Carmela and I today to talk about her book, Playing by Heart. I always love doing these author interviews and I hope you enjoy them too. I'll leave all of the links that were mentioned in the episode today in the show notes and on the podcast website. We have one of those, by the way, if you didn't know. Uh, there's a website. It's pretty cool. I made it myself. Anyways, if you did enjoy this episode, please consider leaving a rating or review or both, which would be super cool. You can also let me know what you think about this episode in particular using Spotify's new episode comment feature. You could also send this or any episode to your other history BFF or anyone who you think needs to be a member of the history BFF community. And finally, this is a very special reminder for the people who listen all the way to the end of the episode. The For the Love of History Epic BFF Meetup in Egypt will be launching this Sunday. And if you're interested in getting the early bird price because there's only 20 spots available for the whole trip and only eight early bird spots available, you can send me a message on Instagram 
or email me for the link to pre-book the trip to Egypt. We're going to go to Cairo. We're going to go to the Luxor. We are going to see our Hepchep suit. I'm so excited. And we will be together and doing fun things. And I'm so stoked about it because the delicious donuts are scattered all around the world. So having a place to come together will be absolutely wonderful. And finally, I just wanted to let you know that the season eight design has finally launched. It took me a little bit longer than expected, but it's out here. It's ready to go. There's two new designs and we have stickers now available as well. And if you're interested in a little merch discount, you can join us over on Patreon for just $2 a month for early releases, merch discounts, and all of the juicy behind the scenes. But that's enough housekeeping for today. Thank you so much for joining me for this and every episode, my delicious little donut. And before we say goodbye, make sure that you go do something kind for yourself. Go touch some grass, go drink some water, and I will see you next week when we talk about the poison maidens of India. Okay, see you later. Love you. Bye.